Uh, good evening, friends. Welcome to the India Power Talk. India Power Talk is a knowledge sharing initiative. We invite international thought leaders and domain experts to share their insights, experiences, and strategies related to business, environment, and education. Today, we are looking at cryptocurrencies, the future of money. Uh, you may be wondering what exactly cryptocurrencies are. Well, you have probably heard of Bitcoin. It was the first cryptocurrency introduced in 2009 as a response to the global financial and economic meltdown of 2008. The original philosophy behind it was that the banking system was no longer reliable and people needed an independent digital form of money. So today we have the honor of welcoming Laurie Souza, a leading expert on this com complex but interesting topic. I would request you uh, to expand the description in a more simpler form. For our listeners that are hearing the word cryptocurrency for the first time, uh, I want you to think of digital money. And it's not something that you hold in your hand. Cryptocurrency is digital money and it was created from a digital program. It's an encrypted program uh, that has an algorithm that cannot be hacked. Okay. And so when you are using this technology, which is called blockchain technology, now you have a store of value and the largest store of value we have right now today in cryptocurrency is called Bitcoin. Now there's a lot of technology words there, but if we just keep it as simple as digital money uh, and that it's actually gaining momentum and gaining value as more people learn about it. Yeah, so I like to call it the future of money. And during the pandemic, I'm told the price of Bitcoin, Bitcoin has really surged. Uh, at, yes. at times whopping 20,000 US dollars, I guess. Um, so some analysts have called it as a safe haven asset, uh, like the gold. I mean, what's your take on the current developments uh, with Bitcoin and other mm -hmm. currencies? Absolutely. So uh, I, I believe that Bitcoin is, it's global. There's no nation that's attached to it. There's no country, there's no central authority. Uh, when we look at central banks, you actually, a bank is an in intermediary. There's actually a person that's working or a bank or an organization that's working that's charging money for you to transact. And so you have somebody who's depositing money in the bank and then, then you are relying on that central authority to actually hold your money to then pay your bills. With Bitcoin right now, you hold your money. Uh, it's Even though it's not cash or it's not a physical coin, it's in a digital program that is reliable. And they, they call it a trustless transaction. Now, I know that might sound a little different. What is trustless? Um, what it means is that it's a transaction of trust because the program is so robust and cannot be hacked, it cannot be changed. Uh, it's a, when you mentioned distributor ledger, it's a digital ledger. It, it seems that Bitcoin was to create money without reliance on central banks. So now, where are, now there are multiple central bank digital currencies uh, or CD, CBDC projects out there. Now, please share your views on the role of CBDCs or, or, or how does, does it really work? Yeah, so uh, right now, uh, banks are catching on to the technology and creating central bank digital currencies, and you may see them called CBDCs. Yes. And those actually are going to be tied directly to the organization. For example, you may have uh, uh, one of your large banks that create their own coin, their own cryptocurrency using the technology, using I the digital technology. Now, when they create their own coin, this is going to be, we don't know yet exactly how effective it will be, but because of the reliance on the central banks today, individuals need that safety net. People need the safety net to know that there is something stable yes. that's going to hold value. And what the central bank digital currency does is it brings in a, a sense of stability for the individual. Uh, and the other word for the central bank digital currency is called a stable coin. 
but what that does is it brings um, some stability, future stability yes. uh, for individuals who are thinking about investing in cryptocurrency. They will see the validity of it through the stability of the bank by the bank issuing a stable coin or a, C a CBDC. So still, Lori, uh, it will be a coin issued by a bank. It will not be like a dollar or, or rup Indian rupee or any currency issued by the sovereign authority. Well, and that's an interesting point because we do have the stable coins will be issued not just by banks, but also by nations. Yeah. The whole reason that Bitcoin came about or blockchain technology came about and the main reason is the decentralization when you're looking at stable coins or CBDCs, now those are taking the technology and centralizing it. So you are back to square one. <laughs> so, so basically all we're doing is digitizing money. Absolutely. Today, Bitcoins and all the cryptocurrencies are issued privately through, through algorithms of computers, if I may say. Now, uh, uh, what happens to those when when the when the nations they start issuing uh, stable coins? We don't really know that yet, but we do know that Bitcoin offers a decentralized way, a decentralized finance for individuals to not have to rely on an intermediary, and where the intermediary could be so cost costly. And if you think about the many people who do not have a bank account, banks can be costly with whole opening up an account and paying the monthly fees. Right. So for all the people who are unbanked, which is now a new vocabulary word, uh, the unbanked uh, population would really benefit from the decentralized currency. It sounds uh, very, very futuristic and sounds very promising, I must say, uh, because it is cashless. It reduces the central uh, control. It reduces the cost of the transaction. I, I, Lori, I agree with you. But still, uh, you know, uh, because uh, the entire world uh, will want to have uh, some kind of, some kind of, uh, you know, uh, some kind of guarantee of the of the value that we are exchanging. So, where does that guarantee come from? So, the value of Bitcoin right now, if it, we have a limited supply, so the total amount of Bitcoin that can ever be produced in this algorithm, in this blockchain is 21 million Bitcoin. That's, the, that's it. That's the maximum. Once, that's the maximum. With the last, with the last Bitcoin, uh, and this was purposeful, it won't be produced until 2040. So right now there are 18 and a half million already produced and owned. So the value is the is based on the future value and the usage. So we already have 18 and a half million issued. The nice thing about it is now we're able to buy fractions of Bitcoin. And I when I say fractions, it doesn't mean I, I might have um, a dime or 10 cents, which goes only to two decimal places. Now I can go to uh, 0. 0.000006. Bitcoin and purchase that much, which we actually have a name for that already. What is that? It's a Satoshi. Satoshi. It's a Satoshi. Yeah, Satoshis are the smaller uh, fractions of Bitcoin. How does really uh, cryptocurrency started? Uh, can you dwell upon that? And, and how did really Bitcoin, the term Bitcoin came into existence? Now, the, the idea of creating a digital cash uh, came about uh, when the internet was created back in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. And so there was something called DigiCash that was tried and it was, it, and it failed. Uh, it wasn't, it was before its time. Like you said, this sounds science fiction, right? It sounds futuristic. Yes. Uh, so DigiCash came about, uh, was never used. Uh, if you think back at the, um, for anybody's interested in video games, there was the Intellitech, which, which created a, a lot of video games, but it was never went to mainstream. Then we went to an Atari, then we went to a Nintendo. We have all these changes across time. 
Mm -hmm. So the technology was created back in the late 80s, early 90s, but there wasn't really a need for it or a value that could be established because everything technology was so new. Now, fast forward to a time where we experienced worldwide recessions. <clears throat> we experienced the dot-com recession of 2001 and 2002, which was worldwide. I know the US was hit pretty hard with the dot-com recession. And then also we had the great real estate recession, uh, which hit the US very hard in, in 2007, eight, nine, uh, all the way till 2011 were the effects uh, yes. where our values just plummeted. And during that time, thousands of banks closed their doors in the United States. So while, while that recession was happening, there were a group of people between the years 2000 to 2009 that were developing a way to create an algorithm or a program that was encrypted where we could digitize money. And so, of course, it requires time, it, it requires a process, and it required think tanks of engineers and scientists. And so we have an individual, his name is, uh, well, individual, or we say a consortium of uh, thought leaders. And, and we, it's an unknown person called Satoshi Nakamoto. Mm -hmm. Now, Satoshi Nakamoto has a, a white paper, and the white paper actually has Satoshi Nakamoto as the name. So I'm just going to reiterate. Sure. We don't know if the founder of Bitcoin's name is one person, Satoshi Nakamoto, or if it is the consortium of four thought leaders that created the white paper, which four, explained... Four thought leaders. Four thought leaders. Yeah, okay. which explained the uh, the the premise of bitcoin so it was created during times of recession when people found that their reliance on banks or their reliance on another party to handle their money was not uh so reliable so so would it be correct to say that it, it's an it's an exchange system absolutely it's an exchange system could you explain in a very simpler form with an example as to how does one get a, crypto, a cryptocurrency, how does open account, and how does one transact on, on a Bitcoin? Uh, one, one would use an, an authorized exchange in your country, uh, or you may know somebody that has Bitcoin already in a digital wallet, and that digital wallet can be held on your phone or on your computer. Now, you can purchase Bitcoin from an exchange once you have the crypto cryptocurrency, can you purchase anything with it? And absolutely, yes, you can. And there's two ways to go about it. You actually would would buy fr directly from your digital wallet. Okay. And it only the transaction only takes ten minutes. There are checks and balances built within the technology that make sure that transaction is valid and I real. See. And who is who uh, hosts uh, or who is controlling or managing this whole technology platform? Nobody is. <laughs> the people are. The people who are using the system are the ones who are the verifiers. <laughs> so we we uh, have an opportunity to become what you call a node, an N O D E. A node is a checkpoint. Okay. So these checkpoints can be set up on anybody's computer anywhere in the world and the transaction is not complete until we have at least the the nodes verifying that the transaction is is a, a valid transaction it's basically a self-generated program that checks itself there are today multiple with cryptocurrencies yes so, so all those cryptocurrencies do they have their own systems or everything works on, under one system bitcoin is the base cryptocurrency it's okay. the base blockchain. Okay. Many of the new cryptocurrencies, or which we call them altcoins, have been built on top of the Bitcoin, Bitcoin blockchain. So a lot of them do use the Bitcoin blockchain, but yet a lot of them have 
built layers and layers and are built on top of those layers uh, of Bitcoin technology. Uh, what is the opportunity that you see for uh, in, in, uh, Indian startups, uh, for example, in the crypto space? Oh, so right now, uh, I just finished a course. Uh, I'm a certified international blockchain advisor. Mm -hmm. And this was held with the organization IOGA, which is the Indian Online Global Academy mm -hmm. that offers the course for anybody who is looking at learning more about blockchain because it is fairly new. Uh, and so right now, the main concern in India is creating regulations around yes. blockchain technology. So we had a lot of attorneys uh, and law associations in the course uh, so they can actually help create the framework around the regulations. So the startups that we're seeing are individuals creating with the technology, with blockchain technology. And this is called, uh, we have something called smart contracts, which is a digital contract. Yes. And so with COVID, a lot of people are working their business from home and or computerizing their processes. And we can computerize the processes using this blockchain technology that Bitcoin runs off of. I see. Yeah, uh, so is, there's a lot of those startups happening. Is there not a standard uh, rules and regulations globally um, um, around the cryptocurrencies? So, I will say that right now there are all being built there. The World Economic Forum is talking about what they're going to do, how they're mm -hmm. going to regulate, if they are able to regulate. Um, so right now, is there a global framework in place? It's all being created as we speak because they see the popularity and the effectiveness of this new currency of transacting in the new currency. So those are all being built as we speak. And I, I believe it's going to take, you know, a few years uh, to yes. get something that in Absolutely. place globally. Yeah. Yes. No, uh, on one hand, what you're saying is right. The cryptocurrencies and blockchain has really helped easing out the transactions. There is a speed, there is a completely decentralization and everything is fine. But if we were to, uh, if nations are going to issue their own bitcoins, you know, it, it, they will they will obviously have their own rules and regulations, and that may clash with the whole concept of uh, making uh, making cryptocurrency decentralized. Yeah, uh, yeah, certainly. Can we can we have centralized regulations with a decentralized currency? That's that's a very very good question. Is that possible? So I'm, a, I'm a lawyer, uh, Laurie. I'm a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you absolutely have to ask that question, right? So, uh, um, and and uh, I, I absolutely believe that this decentralized finance can work just fine. Uh, but maybe what we have is a mindset where we need to regulate, so we all have a safety or a certainty about what how we're going to transact. And this is being new. Uh, there's a little a lot of uncertainty around it. You know, one of the arguments in favor of cryptocurrencies is the speed and the low cost of transactions, you know, including between the people without bank accounts. Now, uh, what are your views on the potential of greater financial inclusions uh, through crypto? Uh, well, I think that the opportunity exists here that uh, countries uh, and individuals without access to banks or without access to saving uh, their earnings uh, has a possibility by transacting in Bitcoin uh, to actually, because the future value is going to be so great, and if an individual right now who buys $10 of Bitcoin might turn it into $1,000 as we see the value continue to go up. Uh, it is planning their Remember, only 0.5% of the population worldwide uses Bitcoin yeah, yeah. or is even knowledgeable about it. So by somebody purchasing it now and holding on to it now, it can create future value, which yes. will allow somebody who, did, who never had an opportunity to have a lot of money or to create, <clears throat> to create wealth. Uh, this is an opportunity right now within the next two years. Uh, for individuals to create wealth for their future and for their family's future. 
so how far uh, how far away are we from seeing crypto going mainstream and what you what according to you needs to be done to support the process i think that people are waking up and we're seeing because bitcoin's on a public ledger you can go to um uh, blockchain.com and you can see the, see the the purchases and there are millions of dollars being moved over into bitcoin and we have some large institutions starting to purchase Bitcoin for their investors. Uh, so it's just like the advent of the computer in the early 90s. Few people had computers at the very beginning. And, and when we got mass adoption, it happened very quickly. And it happened over a period of two to five years. Absolutely. And so that's what we're looking at. We're at the very beginning of the, the two to five years uh, of mass adoption. So right now, when people look at it and they say, oh, wow, Bitcoin's $23,000, that's too expensive. Guess what? You don't need to buy a whole Bitcoin. You can buy a uh, point two, you can buy $1,000 of Bitcoin. You can buy $100 of Bitcoin. See, it, it's fractional. So we, we are using the decimal places now uh, to our advantage of this digital money. What is your boldest vision for the future of cryptocurrencies? I believe that we're absolutely going to be able to use the decentralized system to the benefit of the people. Um, and, and so we, we do have the two systems running in parallel, a decentralized system and a centralized system. And I would say that's going to be over the next decade. Uh, until people start to understand that they can take control of their own finances and create uh, sort of a, their own sovereignty within their own family. And so the mindset does have to shift uh, and that is gonna be up to the people and education. It's gonna be up to individuals believing that they can take care, they can be in full responsibility of their own finances. Um, for the decentralized finance to actually take over if there's going to be a Bitcoin as a, a global standard. Um, but if, if we still have the mindset of people of, you know, we do feel safer and want somebody to help take care of this for me and using an intermediary, well, that still exists with this technology under what we call the CBDCs or the stable coins. Yeah, stable. So, so I see this is going to, this parallel system is going to go for about 10 years uh, while people start to get introduced to it and start to understand it. But ultimately it's the adoption. What, what are we going to all decide to adopt? Um, you know, our world's getting smaller. Uh, no longer are we bound by country. Uh, we can transact anywhere in the world. And if we don't have the conversions of the currency, uh, that makes it all the easier as well. Yeah. So I see it being a, a system or allowing us to have more of a, a global uh, uh, commerce and uh, to be able to transact uh, uh, more effectively. And individuals who, who do not use banks actually have an opportunity to create uh, sovereignty and, and wealth. Yeah. Uh, uh, Lord Laurie, it has been really a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you so much, Nathan.